Well, good afternoon, everybody. The front row is super attentive. <laughs> they actually respond. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the Anlinger Center's Highlight Seminar Series. My name is Lynn Liu. I'm the director of the Anlinger Center for Energy and the Environment. Um, I just wanted to take 30 seconds of your time to, to welcome you back to the new academic year. Um, the seminar series is held monthly, so we have eight very exciting seminars uh, that have been planned for this academic year. Um, before I turn it over to Professor Dyke to introduce our seminar speaker, I wanted to introduce to you uh, several new faces um, that are in our community. So I know Jesse Jenkins is not here with us, so Jesse Jenkins is a newly appointed assistant professor uh, between the Anlinger Center and uh, mechanical and aerospace engineering, working on energy systems. Um, and, and he sits in this building, so if you see him, please welcome him. And then through our Gearhart Anlinger Visiting Fellows Program, we've appointed two visiting fellows uh, this semester. So Harry Warren, who's right there, Harry's going to be with us for uh, the semester. And Harry uh, is the president of Washington Gas Energy Services, has been in the energy industry uh, for more than, um, more than, now I can't say, for a long time. Um, <laughs> so we're glad he's here with us. He's going to bring a very different perspective to what we do at the Anlinger Center. And then we've got Richard Moss, who's here with us um, on leave from uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. He's a climate adaptation and mitigation expert, um, had given a, a highlight seminar last year, and that's how we connected, and so he'll be spending the year with us as well. Uh, so welcome, Harry and Richard. Without further ado, Luke. Thanks again. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Kimberly Prazer from UCSD. She is a distinguished professor and distinguished chair in atmospheric chemistry in the Department of Chemistry and Biogeochemistry and at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UCSD in San Diego. In February 2019, she became the first woman at UC San Diego to be elected to membership in the National Academy of Engineering for a contribution including uh, technologies that transformed understanding of aerosols and their impacts on air quality, climate, and human health. She is the founding director of the NSF Center for Aerosol Impacts on Chemistry of the Environment, an NSF Center for Chemical in Innovation. The center focuses on developing a better understanding of how ocean biology influences atmospheric chemistry, uh, clouds, and climate. She has authored more than uh, 200 publications in, in scientific journals, and uh, I'm going to cite a few of the most recent awards. Uh, which include election to the National Academy of Engineering, the 2020 American Chemical Society, Frank H. Field and Joel L. Franklin Award for Outstanding Achievement in Mass Spectrometry, uh, the 2018 uh, Chancellor's Associated Excellence Award in Research in Science and Engineering, the 2015 Agen Smith uh, Clean Air Award, the 2010 American Chemical Society Award for Creative Advance in Environmental Science and Technology, She's an elected fellow in the American Academy of Art and Science, uh, the American Geophysical Union, and the Association for the Advancements of Arts and Science. Uh, I'm really excited to see her talk. Uh, please help me in welcoming uh, Professor Prazer. Okay, now if I can, the big test. Can I get my slides up? There, all right. Okay, well, um, thank you uh, for that invitation, and um, thank you uh, for uh, inviting me to come and visit Princeton. It's been, people were asking if I'd been here before. I was about tw over 20 years ago, so it looks um, quite different now, um, but it's been, I've had a really good visit uh, with people so far, and I look forward to um, continuing my visits um, throughout the day. Um, there's a lot of overlap with a lot of different things that I do, so it's been really, really fun for me. So I'm going to talk about, uh, very focused on sort of uh, the center that uh, I direct. It's a National Science Foundation Center, as was mentioned. But the sort of the focus of the center is looking at how the ocean, how Mother Nature through the ocean um, is trying to, uh, desperately trying to keep our uh, planet health. Um, and it's, it's challenging right now, is what I will say. 
Uh, the hardest part, I spent my first 20 years of my career doing a lot of field studies. And that involved going out on ships and going to different parts of the world, everywhere basically, with instrumentation that I developed early in my career. Um, the mass spec that I developed is a single, what's called the single particle mass spec. I'm not going to talk about it here, but basically it allows you to look at the composition of each individual particle one by one. Um, and basically, we um, developed this tool, started out you know, the size of a lab, because I was a lab scientist to start, and then it basically got smaller and smaller to where we could fly it on airplanes. And so I'll talk about um, how we've used that instrument uh, to obtain a lot of um, interesting information. But this is the center, and it's, now its title has changed. Um, you can, after I tell you what it was, you'll figure out why. It's called the NSF Center for Aerosol Impacts on Chemistry of the Environment. In its first five years, it was five years and five years, 20 million, 20 million. The first five years, it was called the Center for Aerosol Impacts on, Chemistry, or on Climate in the Environment. And when we went for the renewal for the next 20 million, a couple of years ago, NSF strongly advised us to drop that one C word and change it to chemistry. So we did. Um, the things we do. Uh, because it really is a chemistry center. It's actually funded by the chemistry division at NSF, so it made them happy for more reasons. I probably wouldn't have sold my soul to the devil um, if it wasn't that. It also is truly a chemistry center. But it does focus on climate. So it, it involves now 12 other institutions. It's at UC San Diego. The best part is it's a blend. It is a chemistry center, so the majority of the people involved are chemists, but we have people that are you know, from the geosciences, from microbiology, from data sciences, engineering, uh, what am I missing? Oceanography, I forgot, almost forgot the oceanography part. Uh, but that's one of the, the best, this has been the best time of my career and being able to sort of bring all of these people together and it's been a steep learning curve for me to actually try and do what we promised NSF we would do, which was, we said, you know, we go out to the field, we do these studies, we're out there for about two weeks, out over the ocean, wherever, we sort of take whatever we get for two weeks and then we try to figure out what happened. Well, the problem, in, problem is, in the real world, you know, 20 things are changing at the same time, and so you never leave feeling that great. You never feel like you just figured out this is a key thing that's changing things or that led to the change. You're just never quite satisfied. So the alternative, and we also did this, is to go back to the lab and try and replicate it and then see if you can get sort of that same answer. The problem with the lab is that sometimes when you go back to the lab, it's just really hard to replicate that full complexity. So we said, and, and basically there's nowhere, nowhere on this planet you can go now where you can sort of just look at just the ocean. And that was our goal. So what we said was, we're gonna move the ocean atmosphere into the lab, we're gonna reproduce the oceanography, the physical oceanography, we're gonna reproduce the biology, and we're gonna, we are gonna control the perturbations. We can change and then see what happens. That was the idea. So we're going to replicate the full complexity of the ocean atmosphere in the lab, and they believed us. And so there are, thankfully, so, um, so, there are, so we spent the first few years proving that we could do this, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then once we prove that, then these centers, there's five of them right now that are active. Um, basically, you compete against two or three other centers. They still have this program. In fact, I think they're about ready to award two. But basically, you compete and then you get picked. And so ours is kind of like, in a, in a nutshell, it's, it's chemistry environment. So it's pick a problem where our lack of understanding of chemistry is limiting our ability to fix the problem. So we pick chemistry and climate, specifically aerosols, which I'll talk more about. Okay, so, but one of the things I end up doing, uh oh, let me turn this on. One of the things I end up doing is talking about a lot of other people's work, which is kind of fun. Um, and what, but sort of stepping back to what motivated the center. So these basically are, as you look around, you know, our Earth is kind of under attack right now by, by us. And um, she's, the Earth, nature's screaming as loud as she can right now, saying things are, that things are sort of stepping out of the comfort zone. The Earth is very much like us in that it operates in a, well, you know, life, it's life, it operates in a very narrow temperature range, just like our bodies do. And so... A one degree change doesn't sound that bad. A two degree change doesn't sound that bad. Think of what happens to your body when you start to go up, 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 right? Things start to just, it's not a linear process, right? Things start to kind of act like they're not functioning as well. And you never know which organ it's going to be. We never know what things are, 
Earth is going to do either because we've never done this um, crazy experiment. But basically, we're seeing signs of, you know, drought in some areas, multiple hurricanes over oceans they've never been before becoming commonplace. We don't have, we've got droughts, so then certain areas like California are being hugely impacted by wildfires, and then we have flooding in other areas. So we've seen the shift in the precipitation patterns go from sort of middle of the road to you've got one extreme or the other. You've got drought in some places and you've got flooding in others, and that is becoming more and more common. I often get asked as a climate scientist, you know, was that storm, was that hurricane linked to climate? And it's dangerous to ever answer that question. Don't ever answer that question. The, question, the answer I give is that we can't link any one storm really definitively to climate change. It's weather. That is weather, right? Climate is long-term weather. But what we can do and what we do in climate sciences is we look for patterns. We look for trends. We look for all of these things happening at the same time suddenly. And that's what we're seeing. So this is a number of billion dollar disasters. This is US over time. And these are linked largely to water. And what you see is that over time, there's a trend. And they're becoming more and more common. And this is just going to continue. And so, you know, as we go into this phase of thinking about, you know, the melting glaciers and, you know, sea level rise and hurricanes and flooding, I mean, it's just, you just, it's in the news all the time. And it's really picked up sort of 2010-ish, sort of mapping on to where the temperatures got um, more out of control, right? The last five years are the hottest five years on record since we started making temperature measurements. So what does this have to do with aerosols? Well, aerosol seed clouds, and that's my favorite topic. Um, at the center of every cloud drop is an aerosol particle. At the center of every ice crystal is an aerosol particle. And aerosols are what connect us. The atmosphere is what connects us. This shows it beautifully. These are different types of aerosols in a model going around the globe. The different colors are different types. The two most abundant types are sea spray and desert dust. Those are the two most abundant. But then we also have pollution from vehicles and fires and other things. And so those are all shown here. But the thing you see is that the atmosphere has no walls. And the, you can actually see that they're traveling in the jet stream. They drop down, and they go right into the storm system. They get incorporated right into those clouds. They get incorporated right into those hurricanes. And they affect the precipitation. They affect how much precipitation falls and where. And so one of the things we're noticing is that these atmospheric circulation patterns are changing due to climate change. The ocean circulation patterns are changing due to climate change. And so we're starting to, we think this has a lot to do with this redistribution of water resources, where the water falls and why it falls so precipitously in some areas and then nothing. You have nothing left to fall in other areas. And so we're starting to think that this has to do with which aerosols are going into the clouds and seeding the clouds and affecting um, the, the amount of precipitation they get. So these are the examples sort of natural um, aerosols all the way from the molecular level. Viruses are the teeniest, bacteria, pollen, kind of up to the size of a human hair. We sort of look up to about, well, we look up to about two microns, three microns, because those are the ones that get up and stay up in the atmosphere for weeks it takes. When desert dust is launched up into the jet stream, it takes about two weeks for it to go all the way around the globe, and it does. And so. We're all connected. This is a global problem that we have to address. And so I want to, again, continue sort of to give the background of where I came from before we started the center. One of the things I was brought into was to think about this, the role of aerosols in affecting precipitation and think about this issue of extreme events. In California, we have, in the west coast of the US, we have these things called atmospheric rivers. And these are, um, basically, this shows the band of moisture around the equator. The red is the amount of water. There's a lot of water. And these break off. You can see one is breaking off. And it, they basically slam the coast of California. We used to get a couple of these a year. And they would give us up to 50%, sometimes more, of our entire water supply. So where we say, OK, total annual rainfall is pretty good still. But it was, came so fast and so hard, we couldn't capture it. And it was also starting to fall in places where the dams weren't in the right place. And so everything is kind of messed up right now. And so the question is, you know, why, you know, what, can we look at these? Can we look at the aerosols that are in these storm systems and see if there's any relation? Or is it just the human pollution? You know, what is in the clouds? And so basically, the California Energy Commission, about 20% of our power in California come, electric, comes from um, hydroelectric. 
And so they were really concerned, and they came to me, and they gave me several million dollars and said, you've been doing these measurements of aerosols at the ground for 20 years, you know, here, can you get this on an airplane and fly it and see what's seeding the clouds? And so nobody had ever done this before. People have been doing the microphysics inside of clouds, the number of drops, whether there's ice, you know, all the dynamics, you can do really beautiful job. But nobody had really looked at what happens if it, the clouds are seeded by sea spray or fires or smoke. You know, do you see a difference in whether that cloud, whether that storm system rains or snows or does nothing? That was the basic question. And so we took our instrument, which is looking at single particles, and we put it on an airplane, like they asked. We had all the microphysics um, as well. So the inside, we like, could take a movie of the inside of that cloud and see what it looked like. We put it on the G1 aircraft from PNNL. This is a project called Cal Water that started in 2009. This is me on the plane looking at the data as it comes in. And then I talk to the pilots and say, go back. You know, there was an interesting part you know, in this part of the cloud. These are the inlets. One measures the aerosols. One lets in the cloud drops or the ice crystals. And so with our single particle mass spec, we could look at the composition of every cloud drop. We could look at the composition of every ice crystal and see what actually seeded the cloud and see whether it made a difference or not. The, this is just the, the basically the droplet imaging systems for ice and, and also droplets. These are the microphysics measurements that hang on the, on the wings of the plane. And so we had it all. We finally were going to start to look to see if there's any connection between the microphysics, the physics, and the chemistry. It's kind of a standing theme of mine is like, are, you know, is there any effect? And I have to tell you, when we first did this, people thought I was kind of crazy. That, that, you know, the meteorologists definitely thought I was crazy. You know, who cares what seeded the cloud? If it's going to rain, it's going to rain. If it's going to snow, it's going to snow. What could the aerosols possibly do? Well, one thing that had been hypothesized is that in California, we were putting so many seeds into the clouds that the drops weren't growing big enough to fall. So we were actually shutting off our precipitation. That's the hypothesis we went in to test. Do we see in the non-precipitating clouds that we have just put too much pollution into them or not, right? We found a surprise. The surprise was we noticed that on some days, there was as much as 60% more snow falling to the ground. And other days, the clouds would just sit there. So in a cloud, it can get to negative 40 degrees. That, C, that can remain supercooled liquid to negative 38 degrees C. It won't freeze homogeneously. It has to freeze on something. But only one in a million particles in the atmosphere makes an ice crystal. Only one in a million. So what is special about some of them? And then what happens when you form ice inside of a cloud? And so what we found was on the days where there was 60% more snowfall at the ground, that dust and those microbes were coming from as far as 12,000 miles away. They were coming all the way from Africa, the Middle East, and coming across the Pacific. They actually have done this now for a few more years, and you can actually watch the storm coming in. You can watch the aerosols coming across the ocean. It takes about seven days, nine days to get there. They feed into each other. Same time, same altitude, same part of the storm, same altitude every time. And it's like Mother Nature figured out this recipe for seeding clouds, which is not the way that humans do it. And so, um, you know, it's been really interesting. People have asked me a lot about, can we mimic this? Can we, you know, because if you don't have these seeds, those clouds just sit there. Drizzle maybe, but they don't do anything. They just sit there. So is there some way that, you know, we've tried seeding clouds. We've been seeding clouds in California since the 40s. Not very effectively, I would argue, based on this, this mechanism. But basically, we were able to show that, in fact, there was an enhancement anytime you had ice in the cloud. So then the question became, what were the microbes? Where did they came, come from? They were such game changers. You know, basically, you could form ice at temperatures as, as warm as negative one. So it's been known that bacteria can form ice at warm temperatures. Dust mineralogy also allows you to form ice. It's about negative 15 is as warm as it gets. But the question is, it, made, it was on the cover of Discover. These scientists are finding microbes in the clouds. They seem to be alive, and they seem to be affecting the amount of precipitation. Where did they come from? And so we see this all the time. We've flown now in studies over the Caribbean, over a lot of the United States. We see these microbes. And every time there's microbes, they change the entire properties of that cloud. And so we know a lot more about the microbes in soil. It's pretty easy to go out and get soil. People have been doing dust storms, easily accessible. We've been studying the microbes from dust and from basically sort of terrestrial sources for a long time. What we don't know about 
is the ocean. And so one of the challenges is how do you sort of look at the transfer of the microbes and what's in the ocean versus what's in the air? When a wave crashes, tons of bubbles, and I know Luke and I have bubbles, we love bubbles. So tons of bubbles, I love bubbles, I really love bubbles. So <laughs> tons of bubbles go into the ocean and those bubbles scavenge the biology and transfer it you know, into the atmosphere. But does everything get out? And nobody had ever looked at this before. And again, if you go out over the ocean, you think, okay, I'll go look over the ocean and see if everything gets out. You saw that movie I showed. Everything's mixed up. There's nowhere you can go and just look at just the ocean. So we told NSF, we need to look at just the ocean. It's covered 71% of the Earth, and we don't know what it's putting into the atmosphere. So thinking about this problem, the way people had mimicked, I mentioned you can go back to the lab and do um, model systems. The system that people were studying, and I wanted to look at reactions that happened on it, basically they were using sodium chloride. They might mix in a little bit of magnesium chloride, a little bit of calcium, you know. They would put the salts in, though. You just think about it. When you're out on the beach, you think you're breathing that beautiful, salty air. You guys are going to love me next time you're on the beach. So the ocean is the living ocean. It produces you know, up to 85% of the oxygen we breathe. It is full of life. It's got viruses, bacteria, phytoplankton, all the things, all the things that we have in our bodies are in that ocean as well. And they don't like water. They don't want to be in the water. And so they tend to float to the surface and form this thin skin called the sea surface microlayer. And so when those bubbles crash, when those waves crash, those bubbles scat, they also like bubbles too. They grab, they grab, those bubbles grab those things that don't like water and they just launch them in huge concentrations into the atmosphere. But if you don't use the right bubbles, which is what chemists have been doing for a long time, I worked with oceanographers who said, you guys are, you guys are doing it all wrong. You don't just take a frit like you put in an aquarium. Yeah, you get a lot of spray, but you don't get the right spray. You don't get the right transfer. There's actually a very characteristic scale of bubbles, number and size, that's described mathematically that comes out of a breaking wave. So they said, you've got to use the right bubbles or you're going to produce something and you can study it all you want, but you're never going to be able to use these lab studies to explain the real world because you're going to be generating the wrong stuff. You're going to be looking at the wrong stuff. So, you know, you think about it, and this will come back. The ocean is a forest underwater, right? And people have focused, especially I'm going to talk about gases. I'll just give you a little hint. I'm moving towards gases a lot because those are coming out. And we think about gases from forests all the time. But we don't think about gases that much from the ocean. There's dimethyl sulfide, which is everybody's favorite, but beyond that, not much. And so the question is, you know, what's coming out of the ocean? Can we isolate the ocean and look at the chemistry? And so to do this, it involved three steps. We worked with the microbiologist, Farouk Azam, um, who said, don't just do like those other people did and dump a bunch of phytoplankton in. The phytoplankton is not the answer. The phytoplankton is the food for the bacteria. The heterotrophic bacteria are the answer. That's, he basically showed um, that heterotrophic bacteria are what control the organic composition of the ocean, right? So he said, you know, phytoplankton, get them in there, but then the bacteria kick in, viruses kick in, and you make this microbial loop. There's estimated to be up to 10 to the 15 different organic molecules in the ocean. So how are we, as chemists, we could not possibly buy the right ratios and mix them up. So there are organic synthesizers. So then we talked to the oceanographers who said, get the right bubbles so that you actually launch the right spray. You actually transfer the right things into the atmosphere. And then now we have our starting material. All this work just to get what I really, what we really made this for was to get the right spray out so we could react it. So now we can start doing reactions with sun and oxidants and other things and see how fast humans are changing this spray. And then we can also think about how these reactions change their ability. So basically you've got all the, the ocean has, you know, these microbes have been working, I think, in a feedback, many think, in a feedback loop to try and keep the planet stable. And so now, intercepting that process are humans and human pollution. And so how is that changing the ability of these um, things coming out of the ocean to affect our clouds and our climate? I mentioned this was not in our proposal. The DMS and other VOCs, it's now everywhere. And you'll see why, I think, by the end of this talk. So this was the first study. We took a wave channel. It's 33 meters long. 
We had you know, all the measurements you can imagine. We we're looking at the seawater. We look at the biology. We we're doing DNA, RNA analysis. We do the sea surface microlayer, and we do the air, the aerosols, and the gases. And so we try to do as much as we can online, but we also collect things so we can do more detailed mass spec analysis, high resolution mass spec, other types of tools, spectroscopy, to try and learn as much as we possibly can about this isolated system. And so we did it. You know, we basically were able to show it's a lot more than just sodium chloride. It basically, this, and I'll show you in a second, there's a lot of organics it's in certain particles. Some particles are pure organic, and some particles are pure salt, and some are half and half. So there's actually, it's much more complicated than just dried up seawater and they all look the same. So this is a picture of um, sort of another study that we did where we, I'll talk more about, where we added lights and started inducing our own phytoplankton blooms indoors. And so... Basically, I want to step through why did we go through all this effort? Why did we have to put it in this huge channel with breaking waves? And this is why. There's the bubble size distribution on the left, and on the right is the aerosol size distribution. And what happens is, and that's the characteristic, that little kink is the Hinza kink. Basically, that shape is what comes from a breaking wave. And we were able to reproduce that in the lab through several ways, which I'll show in a second. Only when you reproduce the right bubble size distribution you can see the blue on the right matches. You get a very different size distribution of particles, the sea spray itself. You can see that when you do too narrow of a, of a size distribution of bubbles, the red kind of up on the top, you see that you get a very narrow and a very different size distribution of particles, and they look completely different too. They behave completely different. You would not be able to use these results to explain the real world ever. So why? Well, there's two production mechanisms that have been studied quite a bit, but basically they're film drop and jet drop mechanisms. The film drop is when you set up this stable um, film on top, and when that ruptures, that makes um, the spray, uh, some of the spray. So a lot of the particles in the atmosphere look very organic-y because they have this, this goo, this oil that's sitting on top, essentially. That creates a cavity, which then pulls the jets up out of the center, and you can see that sampling a much different part of the seawater, right? It's going more for the, not the surface, but now it's digging down deeper. And so one of the things we were able to show in case, which nobody had shown before, is that the composition of the film and jet drops are very different. And their properties are completely different. And again, this, this is a beautiful example of physics and chemistry, who's controlling who. But the point is that you can't, you can't decouple them. And so once you have them and you've done them both right, these kinds of things start to pop out. So this was one of our early big discoveries that we were quite excited about. But not everybody has a wave channel in their backyard. And so we developed um, another tank where we do a plunging waterfall that we have to pulse at a certain frequency to get the right bubbles. You can screw it up if you just leave it on. It doesn't work. That's what other people were doing. There's a microphone. You can see me. You may ask, right, there's a microphone. You can actually... Listen to the bubbles pop. That's what gives you the characteristic frequency spectrum. And then we have a little one. It's a spiller. You can see little water spills out. It's much more gentle. Turns out this one is kind of harsh on the critters. It rips off all their little legs very fast. And so, you know, that's interesting. But we, over here, we can grow pretty much anything and look at, look at how that behaves. All right, so we got the physical production right now. What about the biology? Well, this is a phytoplankton bloom or sort of looking at phytoplankton blooms over the globe. This is chlorophyll A, which is used to track the amount of phytoplankton biomass. And what you see is it's very patchy. The ocean's very patchy. There's a huge difference in chemistry depending on which ocean you're in and when. And so how do you, you know, this is part of the reason we got stuck, is how do you figure out where to sail and when to look for the link between the ocean chemistry and the atmospheric chemistry and whether the clouds are being affected or not? I will tell you, it was incredibly controversial when we came into this. It's 30 years of people saying, yeah, you know, the biology matters. It changes the clouds. No, it doesn't. We don't see it effect. There are literally two camps at war. Nobody agreed. And so they would sail to different blooms, and they'd try to get the same answer. Again, they would, every time they'd go out, they'd get a different answer, and they didn't know why. So what we said is we're going to do just like the real world, where you deposit dust, which, which gives you nutrients. And we're going to launch a phytoplankton bloom, as I mentioned. And then that will give us the phytoplankton. Then the bacteria will kick in. The viruses will kick in. And we'll build the chemical complexity, just like the real world, so that we get this mixture, total mixture of chemicals. And we start to ask questions like, do they behave like you would expect them to based on this combination of chem chemical species that you see? I'll tell you, I wouldn't probably be standing here if the answer was yes, because we just go back and make simple systems. This, you get very different behavior. And so 
This just shows the lights. This is the complexity from Farouk, one of Farouk Azam's papers in the ocean. This shows fluorescence images day 0, 4, 8, and 10. But what you see is the, the fluorescence gets to be more and more intense, which means there's more and more biology. It like, links back to that satellite image that I showed you. And so the simple question, I mean, it was really a simple question, but nobody had, been able, nobody had answered it before, um, at least using the right bubbles, um, is what gets transferred and when across the interface? Is it? when the chlorophyll is peaking? Or is, it, is there some other time? Or does it ever happen? Does everything get out? Or does something get out? And so what we did was we put the seawater in, you cap it, you add the nutrients, and you let it go. Well, the shocker was it started to go down. And this was a horrible two weeks. Everybody was, you know, we had one month to do this whole study, and it's just going the wrong, chlorophyll's going the wrong direction. And so then finally it kicked up. Right here we were about ready to empty the tank, and we waited one more day, luckily. And so we got a peak, which is a bloom. But then we, we waited, and we got a second one. And that was, this is when the microbiologists bought in to our story. Before this, they were like, those microbes aren't happy. You know, this is not, you're not doing the biology right. But in fact, if you get two blooms, then it does say that the microbes are cycling and happy. And so then the question becomes, and so I also have on here, I have phytoplankton in green, and I have purple as the, the microbes. So you can see where this is going, right? Before this, everybody just measured the green line. Nobody cared about the microbes. And so the question is, did we see a change in the composition at the peak of the bloom? And, you know, everybody was watching. And we got both answers in the same tank, right? And so we changed nothing. We just, we waited. But in the first bloom, we saw a big change in composition. This oily goo came out. In the second one, it looked very, very salty. So. We didn't make anybody mad at us because we got everybody, everybody was right, right? But we had to think about why. You know, why did this happen? So we found by basically the surface, there was a huge surface tension change and there was a lot of hydrophobic lip, lipids that got out. That was the gooey oil. And in the second one, we saw a much more soluble species, which turned out to be the sugars. The, the, there were no more, basically the lipids were gone. And so then the question became, why? What happened? And so the answer is, it's the microbes. Just like they change the composition of the seawater, they're also changing the composition of the sea spray. And it's the enzymes in particular. And so things like lipase. Take something like this phytoplankton exudate, which is triacylglyceride. It's like an oil. It's a fat. It just floats. So in the first part of the first bloom, we had a lot of this being produced, this oily substance. But if you look back, this is now shown, let's see, lipase activity is in blue. The heterotrophic bacteria is in black. You can see that they were low in the first bloom and they're taken off like crazy in the second bloom. So it becomes a competition. How fast can the phytoplankton produce it versus how fast can the bacteria chew it up? And when they chew it up, they take it into a, a soluble form. They make fatty acids, which are water soluble. And so they now no longer coat the surface of that particle and change its surface tension. So this was the first time it made it big, it got a lot of media attention because we finally could show the link between the chemistry of the ocean and the chemistry of the atmosphere and then take that a step further and look at how it affects clouds. And so these are going to nucleate clouds very differently. The saltier stuff will make better cloud drops and make much brighter, whiter clouds, more reflective. The oily stuff won't form cloud drops as well. They'll be much bigger, they'll be darker clouds, they'll let more light in. So this is potentially one of the feedbacks that basic, basically allows us to control, let's the earth control, I should say, um, the composition of the atmosphere. This is one of the feedbacks that we've been looking for for a very long time. So I just will show really quickly this the organic carbon mass fraction versus size. This is 0.1 microns up to about 10. And what you see is we get this all the time. At the smallest sizes, they become almost pure organic. Those are made by those film drops. At the largest sizes, they become almost pure organic. Turns out these are collected, these are coming, these are whole cells. These are made by the bigger bubbles and the bigger drops. And so we've actually got a model that we're publishing right now that explains what the different mechanisms are that lead to this very characteristic U shape. But the, the, the thing that got us, and it still got us, is this looks at hygroscopicity parameter, which is just how effectively it takes up water. And so something like organic goo doesn't take up water very well. Something very salty, insoluble, will take up water really well. And so if you think, if it's pure organic and gooey, it should, be, should have a hygroscopicity parameter down around 0 0.18, 0 0.17, sort of in here. 
right? And so, you know, we expected the hygroscopicity parameter, which we were measuring in an instrument, to be right here. But in fact, it was salty, and it's pure organic. You would not get this using model systems. We didn't get this. The model systems had us completely believing salts behave like salts, organics behave like organics. But now we got this, and I had a student who spent his five years getting his PhD making thick, soupy phytoplankton blooms. Like, get it as gooey and organic -y as you possibly can. Can we budge this and make it come down? And the answer is no. We can't. The, it's incredibly forgiving to this change in composition. And so, what happens when you look out in the field? It falls right about here. It's about 0.6. So lab studies were up here. This is what we expected. What's going on here? And so basically what we spent the first five years of case doing is sort of figuring out how to make sea spray correctly, looking how it affects clouds. What we didn't do, and this is a project by my student Catherine Mayer, we didn't think too much about the gases. I'm an aerosol person. But it turns out, back to the forest, there's a lot. There's isoprene, beta pinene, all those things. There's, you know, they're all coming out of the ocean too. And so the question becomes, what happens if we um, oxidize? They're highly reactive. So as soon as they hit the air, they get oxidized and can make, they can either coat pre-existing particles or they can form a bunch of new particles, like a thousand times more particles than you get out of the ocean directly. So now this might be why people can't even explain the flux of sea spray with wind because these guys would form under low wind conditions. So you would actually have more particles under low winds, which is what people have been seeing and not understanding. So now our focus is shifting more towards thinking about these types of particles and what they're forming, because these gases are potentially very important. So how do we do this? We take the headspace that I showed you. It's all clean. And so when the gases come out, so think about doing this over the ocean. These are highly reactive. So over the open ocean, you've got, you have to be there right when they're coming out, or they're gone. They're gone in like less than 10 minutes. Ocean's pretty big. Chance of missing it, pretty big, right? This is what we think right now. Because we basically, we can see them. We see gases coming out all the time. Different gases, different mixtures. We call these the chemical smoke signals of the microbes. They're telling us something. We have to figure out what it is, but they're telling us something. But basically, these things will react, this soup will react and form these new particles, which can then grow or mix, and so we send it through this oxidative flow reactor, and we can actually make these particles and then look at their properties and see if those match the field study results a little bit better. And so this, this is just a bloom. The green is the phytoplankton again, thinking about over the course of a few days. And what you see is I've plotted these PAM, potential aerosol mass, aged, so these are the secondary particles. I plotted them, and they're kind of looking like they might be tracking. Right? But if you look at the primary sea spray, it's doing nothing. The number doesn't change, nothing changes. Kind of boring. If we plot primary sea spray versus chlorophyll A, the, the phytoplankton biomass, mm, R squared 0.32 maybe kind of, but not that great. What about the secondary? If we do the secondary, beautiful, right? 0.78. For a complex mixture like this, this is about as good as it gets. So, and we also see the CCN properties. Finally, the hygroscopicity. And guess where it jumps to? 0.6. So turn on the lights, let in the oxidants, boom. So it's all about chemistry, right? So this was pretty gratifying to, to figure this out, um, that it really is a lot to do. That, and this also hints that humans and our pollution can be affecting this um, very well-designed process for about 3.6 billion years. So basically, we're really starting to think about the gases, and you start thinking about these, finally, all these gases over the ocean, they didn't know where they came from. But there's biological. You could have enzymes chewing up the surface of the ocean, chewing up the surface of particles. We see enzymes getting ejected, and they remain active. They go up into clouds, and they're changing those too. Enzymes are the most effective pathway you've got. Or you can start thinking about oxidation processes with pollution and also sunlight. And so we are now, that is, we're full speed ahead on sort of looking at all these different pathways and how those are affecting the composition of the atmosphere. So this is a study I just want to briefly mention, um, which is called CCN. This is now the Wave Channel this summer. Four months, 24-7 of my life. Ninety four people showed up. And uh, summer program, it was, yeah, it was the most important summer I've ever had. Uh, so basically what we decided to do was to take the next step, which was to go beyond the biology and start to add in the reactions. 
So I showed you that oxidative flow reactor. That we've done on a little system. Now we actually have reaction chambers. There's one right there. We had like three of them stationed along. And you can basically control, OK, what happens in an hour? What happens in five hours a day? You get the idea. So simple question. How much and how fast are humans changing the gases that are coming out, right? And, and the spray itself. That was the fundamental question. We finally, you know, there's a lot of people that say, oh, climate's changing, yeah, but it's not us. We're not changing anything. This is a first step to show exactly how much humans are changing one of the key regulators of our climate. And so um, it was a really cool experiment. These are, we, we do this in everybody's undergrads or has undergrad, great undergrads. Every summer we have a team of undergrads come from all over. Um, I'm trying to think if we had any. Yeah, we had one from, actually one, she's from Harvard. Somebody allowed to say that? Okay, anyway. Um, so we had them from everywhere. And uh, they are just powerhouses. They just bring in a bundle of energy. And so um, this is Sarah. And I'm going to show you Sarah's artwork. Because she entertained. I'll show you all in a second. But we did three blooms with the reactions just to see how different things would be. So again, phytoplankton peak followed by the bacteria, just like the cartoon. It actually really happens. And then we have a lot more information. We also are doing, as I mentioned, DNA, RNA. We're also doing taxa taxonomy. Sarah loves taxonomy. Sarah loves drawing. So this is looking sort of before the paddle, the break, and after what they were doing over the course of the bloom. And so we now have like the full picture of the phytoplankton that were there, the microbes that were, we will have, the microbes from the DNA um, analysis that we're doing. And so I think we have a lot of the pieces to start to really sort out this tug of war that's going on between the biology and the human component. And so thinking about the gases, this is again from Sarah. Uh, she basically, these are, this is the evolution that happened in that bloom that I showed you of the different species. Each of these different phytoplankton produce different gases. And so we see these, they're coming out as I say, all the time in different mixtures, different combinations. The bubbles also, as I talked to somebody about earlier, they controlled it. The, the gases that get out too. And so this sort of cocktail that you end up with that you oxidize and then make new cloud seeds is largely determined by the bubbles as well. And so I think we have you know, a lot of diversity between the three blooms and all these changes and we're working up the data. This, just, this project just finished on Tuesday. So it was a long experiment. But one of the things we're eerily interested in, we have a chemical ionization mass spec. For those of you who want to see some instrumentation, I thought I'd throw this one in there. We've got a very sensitive way to go after all of sort of people think about these gases. Once we see DMS, we also see DMDS, methane thiol. We see a ton of reactive sulfur species, a ton of reactive nitrogen. Nitrogen's coming out. When the water warms up, tons of nitrogen species come out. And nobody would seen them. It's some, kind of like if they saw them, they were attributing them to ships or something, but they never thought that they were coming from the ocean. And so we can sort of, we can either use special ions to go after these, we use the benzene cluster, or we can go after more broadly using protonated water clusters. We can look at monoterpenes, it means we see them all. They're not all coming out all the time, and they come out in bursts, and when they come out, lots comes out, but then they're gone. And that explains why people have pretty much missed these most of the time over the ocean. I mean, I've had people just look at me and say, nope, no VOCs come out of the ocean. They go into the ocean. Nope, we, we're now going to be adding an arrow that they come back out. So we just take the head space, we send it into this reactor, and we look at the cloud condensation nuclei. And so basically, this is the thing I showed you. Now we're, I'm going to show you how we connect it to the clouds. And so just this is actual data, hot off the press for you guys, because basically, I wanted to show sort of how we, we do take it a step further. And this is just for the liquid, this is looking at water uptake. So this is an activated fraction, so one would be 100% of them turned into a cloud drop, okay? Versus supersaturation, so we have like a cloud chamber that we can change. And so what happens is, you know, when they're not aged, we get activation, we have to go up to a pretty high supersaturation to get them to activate, right? So it starts here, but as we react them, they just march right down. And so basically, as they become more and more oxidized, they become better cloud seeds. And that will give you brighter, whiter clouds. So we are changing, the human part is changing how the ocean is regulating the temperature of the planet. And so we can do this. We picked a few different regions, pre-bloom, peak, post. And then we looked at sort of the saturation. The lower curve, this one, are the ones that are the best. And those form right at the peak. And so the brightest, whitest clouds you would expect with this mixture to be basically forming right at the peak of the bloom. The, 
and so you, there is this link between the chemistry of the water, chemistry of the air, and the cloud properties. And so we have massive amounts of data like this. These are just snapshots to give you an idea of how we actually link the chemistry to the climate. And so microbes are everything. I'm like a total convert. I'm not a microbiologist, not even close, but I've come to appreciate them. They have a role on this planet and they're trying their best to do their job and we're messing it up. And so primary sea spray, we don't get the changes that people thought were due to the primary sea spray. It's more due to the secondary. When you start to add pollutants, you just see this immediate change in all properties, very fast. It doesn't take much pollution to change things. These reactive gases are constantly coming out. And so only because we have a clean headspace, they just come and they sit and they wait for us to measure them. So, you know, we can just watch them convert from one form to another as the biology evolves. Secondary marine aerosols, which is the oxidized stuff, shows a significant change. And we, we're looking at that as the bloom happens. The death phase actually becomes quite exciting. There's lots of gases coming out during the death phase. And so now we're thinking about all these pathways. And we're asking the question, what controls the composition of the marine atmosphere? Right? It's not probably, the answer is, it's not going to be that much primary sea spray. It's going to be more of this reacted stuff. And so now we have to think, how is the composition of the atmosphere going to change? How are the clouds going to change as our oceans are changing and as we acidify the oceans and as you get different nutrients and you have wildfire ash depositing to the oceans, for example. And so we have to really think, our ocean now, the temperature we just set in September, September 6th was the hottest temperature in September ever recorded at the Scripps Pier. It was warmer than Hawaii in San Diego. And it happened last year in July. So this pattern of warming oceans is going to become important and all the biology is going to change, all the emissions are going to change, all the clouds are going to change. So this is a huge, huge um, issue. I'll also say that we're also seeing, I, I talked to a few people about it and I'm happy to talk more, but we also are looking at how the um, runoff, pollution runoff going into the coastal regions, is that getting lofted back and how is that affecting human health? We're seeing a lot of evidence of pollutants going into the water that are then getting airborne. That People thought about it from a swimming perspective or a surfing perspective, but they didn't think about the breathing perspective. And so um, we're making people not so happy right now, unfortunately. But next, we're building this system called SOARS. It was funded by the NSF, where we can actually now control temperature, wind, and sunlight, and we'll have an integrated smog chamber so we can actually do wind speeds up to 15 meters per second. Not as high as we would like, but realistic, this is what we've got. And so we'll be able to sort of think about these experiments where we put a dome on, we can bump up CO2 to, you know, 1,000 ppm, whatever you want, look at feedbacks with the biology, how that's changing things. We can really start to, we can control the temperature so we can look at different oceans, different species from different oceans, do the experiment in the lab before it's too late and we're doing it outside and sort of see what really matters um, in terms of the change. Changes. So this is just the simulator, as I say, we call it SOARS, where we can just pop things off, send them into the chamber, and then do all the studies we've been doing. But now it'll be a much more massive system with winds. And so I have to thank, I want to thank the people that have done the work. It's an incredible team, and it's been a really rewarding experience to lead this team. I've learned a lot about leadership, um, and this was sort of trial by fire because they don't train us how to do this, but I have learned a lot over time. And so if anybody's ever on the West Coast or, you know, nearby, you know, you're well, we love giving tours and showing off our toys. And if you ever want to do measurements, I've already talked to people about sharing samples. We're happy to share samples. Um, but with that, I will be happy to answer any questions, and thank you very much. Uh, first of all, amazing stuff. This is really great. Thank you. Uh, I had two questions. One short one. Can we find that video of the moving aerosols across the globe yeah. anywhere? Because that I can just yep. look at that all day. I like that one too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let's see. Oh, where is it? Uh, there it is. But maybe moving on to the sort of an actual question I had. Because um, I can imagine. Yes. God. Um, anyway, so I can imagine that you know all over the globe that the temperatures are different and the microbes that live there are different and the chemical composition of the, of the ocean might also be different. Does that have any effect on all of this? On or, the circulation patterns? Well, no, sorry, on, on the work that you've just shown where all these mechanisms basically still happening for different compositions and different microbes. Mm, 
so, okay, I want to make sure I understand your question. So you're saying that the oceans are getting warmer. Is that changing things? Is that... Or well, I mean, that? like, in different areas across the globe. Right. I can imagine that different bacteria live right. there. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you, so right now what we've been doing, what we've done so far is just our water, right? But in this new system, we, we, have, we're also culture, we have a lot of cultures from around the world, so we can start thinking about other oceans. We just haven't gotten there yet. The, our own ocean has kept us quite busy. And I have to say that with the temperature change of the last couple of years in the ocean, it looks completely different already. You know, and so we can't... I mean, the gases that come out. We're seeing nitrous oxide, all the nitrogen species that are supposed... The arrow goes this way in all the biogeochemical cycles. It is coming... We thought we had leaks. We thought we had contamination. When you warm up that water, it's, it just changes. It changes the microbes. It changes, you know, obviously more gases are going to come out. But it also is like a switch because the metabolism starts and they just start spitting stuff out. So right now what we're trying to do is understand... We need to use, do something big picture vision, but to think about the microbes, if we knew what they were, we knew all the species of the phytoplankton, the viruses, the bacteria, and what they were, could we link that, could we use that to predict what the gas mixtures would be, right, under certain conditions? So this is a great data science question. We have a new data science institute at UCSD, so they love this. And so we're going after it just to see, you know, measuring it one by one, isn't going to get us there, right? So we kind of have to look at this community response, and that's, that's where we want to go. It's only going to get better from here, but it's going to get harder, but better. So, yeah. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this talk. Um, my question is, um, because the cloud is always the largest uncertainty in the climate sensitivity to external forcing, I'm wondering um, if the this uncertainty will be narrowed down or increased by including the feedback from microbes? Um, Probably get bigger, because it's not included right now. So every time we add something new to the model, the uncertainty gets larger. And then we feel like we're failing, but we're actually, we got to go in that direction. I expect the uncertainties on clouds to get bigger and bigger and bigger until it finally, we're fooling ourselves. I have people, modelers, that I'll say, you know, well, you know, I mentioned this. Okay, we're seeing these gases. We're seeing more particles. Like, can we? And they'll say, oh, my model is not sensitive to that. Well, because you don't have that knob, right? And so, you know, it's we're getting better, but I expect that, you know, this is huge. This is a huge effect. That's not in any. You know, people have been trying to explain this. It's about 11 orders of magnitude variability in the number of particles you see over the ocean. Nobody knew why. Nobody knew how to treat it. And now we're actually showing it's due to these sort of gas. I think it's a lot due to these gases. It's not just wind speed, right? So now that's all they have in their model is wind speed. So it's going to, unfortunately, it's probably going to, I expect all, I think the radiative ones are, start, there are the, sorry, the, um, the direct effect, you know, their interactions with light. I think those uncertainties are starting to get smaller, but I expect the ones for clouds, you know, we still can't predict why a single cloud's in the sky. So I kind of expect that we're going to, push it the wrong direction for a while, but that's okay. That's progress. It's just a classic case of we don't know all that we don't know. I, some vice president said that or something, right? But um, that's not good. Anyway, I'm not Thank someone you. I want to be quoting. Okay, um, but yeah. Thanks very much. It's perhaps a similar question. Uh, what are the implications of your work for um, projecting whether the increasing clumpiness of precipitation that we've been seeing with climate change is going to accelerate or decelerate? Hmm. And for that I, matter, can you help? I can't do that off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could, but that's something that would be interesting to put in. We hope to be able to parameterize some of these things, right? So you could actually predict, right, the number, the change in cloud seeds or the cloud properties, right, and sort of predict you know, link it into the dynamics because it's got, right, you have all of those pieces that go in. And so if you get more gases, you get more, you know, you'd have to put it in a model. But again, I think right now there's nothing in the model for this. And so one of the things we're starting to, we're starting the dialogue, and if you know people who have this and are interested, we're talking to a lot of climate modelers right now. Like, what do you need, right? We can measure everything, we can make it out, you know, so what can we give you as a product? Because the planet is changing really fast. We got to speed this up. We don't want to just measure stuff. We want to be able to put it towards solutions. And so, you know, um, the answer to that is we just need to, we all need to work more closely together to, to go after this, the measurements and the models. And so without the model, I can't, I can't, I can't tell you. And, and a much more basic question, one question that I've been asked that I 
can't answer is why does there appear to be an increase in the clumpiness of precipitation with increasing climate change? Is it because of the differential cloud seeding? You could, I mean, people link it, right? Is, you know, the answer is either sort of, more people would probably lean towards something to do with the, the dynam change in the dynamics, right, than the seeds. But I don't, know the, I don't know the answer either. You're giving me the question you don't know the answer to. Boy, oh boy, in front of all these people. <laughs> So there, there has been a lot of studies in terms of uh, how a smog and aerosol is formed from uh, hydrocarbons, mm -hmm. and the emission from uh, engines on the ground. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, from chemistry point of view, what is really new that the uh, the uh, the molecules generated, the chemistry generated from ocean uh, species, different from what we have been studied on, for example, emissions from uh, engines. And uh, those things. And also, I put, pay attention that you put a ozone as a very strong oxidizer there in terms of chemistry. Right. And they form probably uh, something like a, a, a creek in the, in the media yep. building this kind of aerosol. Right. But if, once you have a NOx coupling with this, yep. and then the chemistry changes a lot. Right. So, what is really new in terms of chemistry makes the ocean different from the land, on the land? Yeah, that's a great question. So, we just started thinking about this because. What we saw, you know, basically, I think is going to become more and more important, but um, like at least in California, they don't put any VOCs from the ocean or NOx or anything coming out of the ocean in their inventories, right? It's all humans, right? And I think the, they're substantial ones. We saw it. We saw tons of NOx, for example, coming out of the seawater. It was denitrifying. We, they just added it, I found out, for soil not too long ago. But now you've got an ocean. It'll denitrify, right? And so then what happens is what nobody is, that I'm aware of has addressed this, and as I say, especially in a warming climate, is what happens when they mix? And that's your question, right? My guess is, well, we did it. We took those boatloads of emissions that were coming out and then just did this one simple, it was simple, as you say. We have, you can play with the NOx ratios. You can spike this chamber. You can do all kinds of things, and that's the direction we have to go. But just with this simple system, when we mix them, we produced so much more pollution. So, you know, we think about urban pollution. We think about the ocean as this natural source. But nobody that I'm aware of is thinking about what happens when you mix them. And when you mix them, especially in a warming climate, you're producing a lot more. Now, the NOx thing, I went back and looked at the papers in the literature, and you know, people have looked at denitrification from seawater. But for some reason, like when you look at the satellite data and things like that, where they see lots of NOx, they see it. They see tons of NOx in coastal zones, right? And when you look at that, they always attribute it to the ships. Right? And on land, they'll attribute it to the cars and the trucks. But we saw it with no ships, no cars, no trucks. Right? And so this is just opening up, I think, a lot more really important questions. The thing I would like pe to see people do based on, you know, I went after, we went after the big mix. Right? So you're, you're already building in things. Right? But when you look at the smog chamber studies people use to address these, you learn about Kriggy intermediates. You learn about fundamental mechanisms, which is important. What drives me a little crazy, because I'm, I'm in a hurry to fix this planet, so I get a little, little crazy when I see one component, isoprene plus NOx, isoprene plus ozone, because when you actually have the real mixture of all the VOCs and you add that to NOx or add that to ozone or OH or whatever, you get a completely different answer, right? And that's what's happening in the real world. So all of our work is designed, everything we do, in case, anyway, is to go after the real mixtures and see what would really happen in the real world. Other people can go back and play with the mechanisms for a while, but we don't have time. So I, I hope that we can go after the questions that you're asking, but we will do it in a way where I envision with this new chamber, where we, instead of like, we will look at ozone, I mean, we'll look at individuals, but I can't wait for the day when we get to just take the headspace and mix in real air, right? You just have it characterized and mix it in and see what happens. So we're really trying to do the real mixtures to go after that soup and try, try and understand. I'm sorry, I need to preface that I'm not a 
oceanographer uh, at all. But I did see what are you? last night. I'm chemical biological engineering. I oh, had okay. a quick question okay. about your model. Um, <laughs> so for the ocean, from what I understand, uh, like you have the underwater currents, like the deep sea currents, and there's like a great deal of mixing there, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what causes some be. kind of mm -hmm. weather effects. Upwelling. Moving mm -hmm. up, right? right. Does that, so with that mixing, creating like a mixture on the top of the ocean surface, and then with the interactions that occur, like that you've studied, is that, the, it, what I'm trying to ask is, that, is, is the depth of like the ocean and like that interaction, is that, would you predict that that would have much of an effect on what's coming up into the air? It'll have a huge effect. And is there a way to model that, or is that like kind of like a later step? Or? People are looking at that. You know, there's certain upwelling zones, well characterized, people are starting to look at, but more from like how it's affecting the ocean biology, ocean chemistry. Not that I'm aware of in connecting that to the air, right? And so it's delivering, usually, a lot of times, it's delivering different temperatures and nutrients at the same time. And so, um, you know, there's massive changes that happen to that seawater. And so then the question becomes, you know, how does that translate? And I'm not aware of anybody that's looking at that yet, but we, we can simulate that in the lab. And we can um, postulate to like pollution then, for instance, coming off of like, let's say like Japan, yeah. going underwater could come and circulate back and pop up elsewhere? There's, they sort of, I think from an oceanography perspective, people understand sort of where things, you know, sort of pop up. Um, this is not my area of expertise, but like I, I know like the California current, we, ha we understand like all the upwelling regions and when they happen, it's really, they just use temperature usually as the gauge to know when it's happening. That's pretty well characterized. What's, I, what I would be interested in is how that actually would lead to a change, you know, in, as you say, in, in the, the air. Aerosol. The other thing I want to mention that I didn't mention that I think is kind of interesting, the other thing that changes things is coming from the top. It's a deposition. It's not just upwelling, but it's also now the atmospheric circulation patterns are changing. So the dust transport, all that, that's the nutrients. Those are changing. Wildfires, wildfire ash, completely different mixture of nutrients. That's going to change all the biology too, right? That stuff depositing. The other thing it's going to do, you know, you hear so much more about greenhouse gases as opposed to the aerosols. You know, aerosols, you hear, oh yeah, the aerosols are keeping things cooler. That's true. But the other interesting thing that aerosols do that I did not appreciate is that they, you know, these blooms are what draw the CO2 out of the atmosphere, right? Very well. And so it turns out that how strong the bloom is, what type of bloom it is, whatever, and this is not your question, but this is something that's actually kind of cool, so I'm going to use this second, two minutes, thank you, um, is that basically it, effect, it affects the amount of CO2 drawdown, which we all care about, right? This is an aerosol effect that I had not thought through. And so depending on if you deposit wildfire ash or dust from Africa or dust from Asia, you'll get a different drawdown number. What do the models use? One number. Never been measured. That's huge. That's controlling the equilibrium of the CO2 between the ocean and the atmosphere. So we're going after that as well, just to see how variable it is depending on what you add. But yeah, you're right. You're thinking about it from the bottom. I'm also thinking about it from the top. There's so many perturbations that we, we have. A, we have job security with this one, but we're hurry, We're trying to hurry it up. So yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect. Time. And I think we can thank uh, Professor Prezi again for this talk. Thank you.